Uh, so, hello everybody, uh, welcome. I'm going to talk about uh, Unity Capsule, uh, which has a reputation, if you like, as a piece. I'll try and guide you through it, um, and relaying upon my experiences, which has been around 10 years of playing the piece. So if you like, it's a work in progress, still. Uh, and so, let's begin. So as you can see, uh, I've written here 1975-76 for Pierre-Yves Vartot. Um, anecdotally, um, Pierre-Yves received another piece called Cassandra's Dream Song. And uh, Cassandra's Dream Song, apparently Pierre-Yves played quite well, to the point where Fernando said, I have to write something harder for him, and he did. Um, it's written explicitly with the player and instrument in mind, so it's not just about performing, uh, performing with the flute, but actually the player's body um, is used in a very prescribed way. And it's the beginnings of, you could call it parametric polyphony. Um, just one moment, I have to pick up some notes. Give me a second. Cassandra's Dream Song. It's Cassandra's Dream Song. And so the introduction, or if you like, the, the guidance notes to Cassandra's Dream Song state that in, this, in that particular piece, and I think this applies to Unity Capsule as well, is that no beautiful cultivated performance should be tried to, to be attained. Um, some of the combinations of actions specified or in any case not literally realisable or else lead to complex and partly unpredictable results. No attempt should be made to conceal the difficulty of the music by resorting to compromises and inexactitudes. These are designed to give a superficially more polished result. On the contrary, audible and visual degree of difficulty um, is to be drawn as an integral structural element in the fabric of the composition itself. So this gives you a perspective of what Fernie was thinking about in terms of his music. Um, so, and here are some very short parts of the score, brief extracts. So instantly we see that there's a division. Um, the flute, classically speaking, really only has uh, one line. So now suddenly we have this ulterior line at the bottom, which is the voice. The voice can either be um, plosive, i.e. or it can also be with the vocal cords actually uttering, um, as you will hear, uh, quite basic but nevertheless percussive or additive values to the flute. Um, you also see ideas of um, pulses within pulses, if you like, as sort of other rhythm within rhythms, and those are overlaid at the top. Uh, that score there. So I mentioned that there's obviously the voice. Um, as we go on as well, I'll show you other elements which are used by fairly well, in a way as, as if they are, the body is itself an instrument. So if we go on to this part here. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, as you can see here, there's a much more uh, dense layering of what's going on in front of us. The, the tongue, for example, the diaphragm, as in the muscular part of you breathe, um, the breath, the voice, the lips, this is all objectified in a way. It becomes part of the composition. Um, and my job as a performer is to try and integrate this in such a way that it becomes a musical discourse within the flute. Um, as you can see as well, there's lots of text. For example, suddenly claustrophobic and secretive. Um, as well as technical uh, details such as accent pattern, weight of accent varies in direct proportion to the dynamic level of the upper line. Now, to me that suggests self-management. Instantly we have a dynamic where the performer is managing his or herself within the performance. Contextually speaking, I'm redrawing parameters to, to choose to have some sort of um, input into the path of the composition. 
as far as I can see. So this objectification really passes through the performer in many ways. And so my experiences, I've tried to harness these things um, and we develop my own interpretation of the piece um, as I go. Um, other thing that you might spot, I hope you will, is that there's certain disassociation that takes place um, with the, the flute and the, the player, or we're not really sure who is who. And that changes an awful lot in the piece, both in a physical plane and in a sonic plane. <coughs> Clearly, there's a, a huge amount of intensity or density, whichever way you want to see it as well. And there's a layering that goes on. We can see more of that here. Let's zoom in for you. So, yes. What I've done here for you, just to uh, mark out what's happening where at this particular bar. So this is the first bar you have here. The yellow is actually the embouchure. So the contact, the very point of making sound, is being disturbed. Any point is moving. And that signal, if you like, that cusp that moves, that signifies that. Then you have another trajectory, which is the one of the actual pitch of the instrument, which is the red line that I've demonstrated for you as well. The diaphragm, which can impede or uh, accentuate certain uses of the breath than the flute. And also accent patterns, which you probably can't see very well, but there's the blue accents, which exist within other rhythms, within other rhythms. So it's a nested quality to these. And as you can see, the voice, which I've just mentioned, well, rather uh, highlighted at the bottom. Um, these use a phonetic um, tablature or a phonetic type of uh, instrumentation, which um, in this case is e and then and you superimpose that on a flute and you have something very different indeed. Um, so the flute and the voice really start to, to mix together. And here's another extract from just from the end, um, in which all the materials are applied senza misura. So you can see here again, I've just no, annotated for you, uh, for example, the voice, which is yellow below, which can also, as I said, be articulated or vocally uh, vocally uh, initiated. We have the embouchure, even what you would call expressive markings, i.e. vibrato, is starting to be um, very clearly annotated as well. Um, and so this is really the only point in the piece where, if you like, things start to become, at least in the score, unhinged, <laughs> i.e. there's been very, very strict use of uh, nesting of rhythms, of, of gestures being actually contained, and here finally they're released. Like it's, it's, uh, just to give you a, an idea of um, the score we're looking at, we're thinking about, and I've, as you can see, notionally mentioned schematics. It's my indication here that what he's doing is building an instrument, which is actually a person who actually operates, if you like, or is involved in this this instrument and to the point where I become the piece. So to bring it to a Deleuzean uh, thought, the main uh, encounter I've had with this piece is resistance, both of the score and resisting any attempts that I have to try and uh, to quantify exactly, exactly what's going on. And secondly, with myself, my body, can only perform at a certain level or achieve certain things, I consistently am reminded of the fact that that's not actually what's on the page. Um, but nevertheless, we, we go back to Fernigo's note about this idea of um, the improbability of what he's written down. He's really talking about a different level of working with music from the performer's perspective. So here I've noticed, uh, well, noted uh, Deleuze and his rather enigmatic way of thinking about resistance and how it forms itself in art. Um, which is essentially for me a, a human, fallible and um, fragile uh, performance, if you like, in this case. Because 
I see this music, even though it's, it, might, it might seem quite rigorous, even uh, brutal. It's actually an incredibly fragile experience. So how did I get around it? How did I do this? How did I make an interpretation of this piece? Just to give you a quick look at that score there. Well, really I had to reconstitute everything that I thought I was <laughs> as a musician. Uh, because you're faced with such a challenge. Uh, that's a personal response. It's not everyone's response. So, uh, I basically had to take apart what I believed uh, to be a normal interpretation and put it into a context in which a piece doesn't give you any allowance, uh, any um, respite, musically or technically. So I started to constitute or reconstitute parts of my technique to suit the piece. So I built myself, if like, as a technology or an assemblage in a Deleuzean sense to try and manage the piece, to build the, both conceptually and physically what I needed to get through it. And in a way to harness my own ideas about how the piece could become. So I reconstituted IE. For example, I would take um, the actions that happen between um, the physical moving away, the physical distance of the instrument, which does happen during the piece, in combination with making sound. How do you, if you imagine contact happens with the instrument here, and you're, you're told to move the foot away from the mouth, how do you still produce sound? How is that a sonic event? Should it be? So these questions, if you like, were very much at the heart of how I approached this piece and how I practiced the piece really to try and redraw some ideas of what the instrument could and couldn't do and in a way get around ideas get around proposals that Fernando had for, for me and for the piece to try and um, achieve at least something that was close to what was on the page so as I say, a practice that's conceptual approaching the instrument and incorporating the body so I didn't start at page one I started whatever I could find a way in um, and from then I built the piece outward. Um, this is very important as well in terms of learning because my opinion at least is that we don't necessarily start, a composer doesn't start a piece at the beginning. They start a piece with an idea which then proliferates and becomes a beginning in some shape or form. So as a, as a performer why should I approach the piece from the very very beginning? But rather I approach it from where I feel it has some purchase or some resonance with me. And so it's the idea of linearity and in fact avoiding that, if anything. As I said, we have a, an assemblage of various techniques, um, but always at the heart of that I feel is the fragility of the experience. Um, that's something which I hope will be clear when I perform part of the piece. Unfortunately, I don't quite have enough space in the room, so what I'm going to do is there's a pause in the middle. So I'll play the first half of the piece and just come back to this if that's okay. If I have time at the end, I'll pick it up. Okay. It's always wise to check. <laughs> I have some stories about that as well.
So that was um, the first part of the piece. Um, I might continue with the, the end before I finish. This is uh, from a recent book by Lewis, which in the audience, um, some quotes from there, to give you an idea of what Fernie intended uh, by creating a situation in which the performer is placed in a, if you like, an interpretive situation which requires the imaginative, technical, um, historical approach to performance. You're drawing upon everything virtually at the same time. Um, this also starts to point towards how I feel about the piece now, or how I'm working with the piece now. And he mentions the measure being a space. Um, a space which has an energy quotient, um, which also faces the necessity of leaping to quite different states. Um, which moves me along to Deleuze. And he talks here, as you can see from this quotation, about time. Um, I hinted earlier on about these ideas of time, yes, within time, in terms of the piece. Um, in my interpretation, um, now, I feel that gesture is itself the measure of the piece. Um, rather than being a, a, a thing, a, a, having a regular tempo, so to speak, Really, the bars are filled with gestures which themselves are determined by my own technique, determined by my ability to get through certain passages, uh, or facility to get through certain passages. And so to apply a very standard classical method of measuring this piece, I think, is actually not the way to view the work in its totality. Uh, so where do I go from here? I've encountered this piece built myself as an assemblage of sorts, um, questioned how I navigate the piece, both a temporal sense and a personal, physical attitude. What has it done? Well, it's had a, a lasting change on me as a musician, um, it's something which is still very much um, happening. And as I go, this piece changes, and as do I. Um, the question now for me is, where is the content in this piece? Is the content the score, or is it actually my implication of the gesture, which is so intrinsic to this work? Uh, at the moment, I feel that the gesture, in a way, qualifies what's going on in the page. And so I have to ask myself, uh, with this score and other scores of similar complexity, um, is the, what, to what end, or do, what, what differences are there now in the composer-performer relationship? The gesture is, this important? And where does it place other scores that, like this that I tackle? It's created an overspill as well, um, that I feel that I've had to recompose myself in a way um, into exploring ideas of temporality, repetition, um, of using gesture as a way of measuring music or time um, in my own compositional work, which um, is very much a project I have my own, um, if you like, development as, as a practice to, to experiment with the ideas that I come across in these pieces. Um, equally, I'm sometimes disturbed with the fact that maybe this piece is now my piece, in a personal sense. There's a certain sense of fidelity that a, a performer has to a score, but I feel that, um, for, at least in my perception of the work, that I've taken on the work and applied my own methods in such a way that I'm not quite sure if Bernie recognises it anymore. Um, and the idea of non-linearity. So when I approach pieces from now on, or for the past few years, I tend to, to apply a, an idea of taking elements of works, not the beginning, not the end, but not, not having basically a linear approach, but taking points of entry and using those points of entry to try and navigate my way to the piece. Um, how are we doing for time? Five minutes? Shall I play the end of the piece?
silly question. I'm sure it's not. Um, how do you feel about it? If this is your piece now, how do you feel about other people's performances of Unity Capital? Um, I, I think I entrust that to each person. I don't really feel that I have ownership of it, but I guess it's my space, if you like, which has opened up um, as a part of all this process. Um, this idea of gesture in space as well, I guess, is a very particular thing to each person. So I think that's entrusted to all of us. So are they playing the same piece as you? Um, I hope so. Well, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the other way to look at this is that I know that my recording of this piece is very fast. And some, in some cases, that's not really been... It's been questioned that why is it so fast? <laughs> Um, it says presto. Oh, it says as fast as possible, actually. Yeah. Isn't the marking of presto? The, the, the tempo marking at the very beginning? There's no tempo marking at all. Are you I don't think there's any tempo marking at all as to how the performer no, does. It, isn't the word presto? The word's the presto. Yeah, so. But it could be either end of that presto. Yeah. And then the relationships after that are actually decided by the, the ratios, if you like. So I think it's a third slower in the second part of the piece. Um, so, um, I guess Brian won't really answer that question either because it's a piece that he, another Brian wrote, if you, <laughs> if I, yep. yeah, what you told me, so. Well, it's, it's, if you like, a, it's a kind of like an etude situation. So you have a particular instance of a combination of all techniques, um, and I take them out of that, that combi out of the score into my own um, sort of practice, which could be often this with electronics, um, the very simple electronics, and playing with those ideas and integrating that, that uh, often a juxtaposition of techniques into small etudes of my own, which tend to grow or move from that particular technique. Do you feel like playing this piece so intensively has changed you as a performer? As a performer and and if, if it is the case, how? Could you define it? Uh, uh, well, stuff? on a physical basis, yes, there's a huge amount of change. Mm -hmm. um, this whole idea of making a psychology behind the piece, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it'll ever face anything as taxing. Well, one wouldn't, wouldn't find anything as taxing as this anywhere else in your performance career. So that really, in a, in a way, it sets a boundary, mm -hmm. which is very hard to surpass. So as a performer, I feel that I said I can negotiate these things much more quickly. I can, and like, I can neutralize, the, if you like, the, the difficulty in a way. Um, and that creatively opens up other doors for me, which are not related to a score. I think the score is quite an interesting um, pivot point for lots of things that I'm doing, really. Um, and I think I really believe in taking something away from that context and trying to put it within your own. I hope that answers the question. some sort of choice as to what's important to you. And I guess you, you build a framework or an idea of what kind of textures that you want to convey, mm -hmm. and what, what textures you find are interesting, mm -hmm. that complement the form in its totality. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that idea of, it's really not about necessarily line or uh, melody, but actually textural and, if you like, um, temporal changes. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, the resistance, if you like, 
in the score is very tangible. How does that? How can I make that happen in sound? I mean, everything. everything. So, um, for example, oh yeah, I don't want to draw uh, trite examples, but by playing, but there's a way of making, I guess, the resistance in sound in my, in my body, I guess, tangible mm -hmm. in many ways. So I've looked at techniques in this particular piece which make that much more powerful mm -hmm. than I'm thinking. Clear pitches to make between Bacon and Furnival. And if you imagine that, in a way, the flute player is being forced out of the flute. Imagine that if in the parts of my voice suddenly appears yeah. from the texture, it's as if I'm being contracted from the inside, mm -hmm. and this voice it submerged suddenly pops up from mm -hmm. there and it goes back down again. Mm -hmm. So that's at least my visual, um, imaginative response is that there's, there's someone inside this machine who occasionally appears and then disappears again. And if you think, I think of bacon and the way that the mouth tends to erupt. Always. So you mean originality? In the, in every time you play it, you play it different. If you play it differently, I really feel that you fall back into the first. I think there's, a, if you like, a, um, an entrainment that the body finds its way of coping with these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think in a way, once it's set, it's, it's generally that's the case for the piece. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, I know that I generally hit ten minutes in this well, yeah. piece. I have to, if I do it any longer than that, it feels wrong. Mm -hmm. But you ask yourself for the final time, that you try to like, look at it again and rethink certain strategies? Yeah, I think you can, but it's also, that's, I think it's in a different, it's not a, for me it's not a, a form. Mm -hmm. I, um, this, this ratio, this ratio, this ratio, they have to, they, I think for me they're intact, but what's within those? Um, I have much more, uh, I guess, uh, for with being, being a flute player, I have much more ability to interchange between levels and to accent and move away. And theatrically speaking, as well, I have much more, around, much more space to to execute that. So I have a variation of sorts, mm -hmm. but I do believe that um, it's very much a, a process that's now, in a way, solidified mm -hmm. in what I do. But the finitude of it is, is different. 